my long years, long years, 10 years in UP. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to attend our NMC and moderate our uh, 12 CAS Student Faculty Research Conference. The theme for this year is Fourth Industrial Revolution, Challenges and Opportunities for the Arts and Sciences. The theme for this year's conference, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is said to be the fusion of technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, Internet of Things, 3D printing, quantum computing, genetic engineering that merges the physical, biological, and digital domains. Described as cyber physical systems, this revolution introduces new ways in which technologies built from the third revolution are implanted in the society. This will fundamentally transform the way we live and work, establishing a technology-driven and human-centered future. As such, three experts are invited to give us a glimpse on what the fourth industrial revolution entails and how we should respond to the challenges it brings. The fourth industrial revolution is not only about technology, it is also an opportunity for everyone to make transformative changes and policies in education, employment, nature management, among others. Understanding what the fourth industrial revolution is an important step for the College of Arts and Sciences to learn how, as an ed education and research institution, it can respond to changes and opportunities for arts and sciences. Palakpaka naman sa nagsulat ng ating introduction. So the objectives of the CAS Student Faculty Research Conference are to provide a forum for discussion of the challenges and opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution, especially in the arts and sciences, to share and discuss various researches in the college, to establish linkages within UPLB and research institutions, and to provide a venue for multi-stakeholder interactions among scientists, artists, academicians, students, and researchers. We do have 49 paper presentations for this year. Palakpakan naman natin ang ating mga salili, ang ating mga estudyante at mga kapwa faculty members. Distributed in seven sessions, we have Arts and Humanities, Basic Research, Environment and Agriculture, Health, Information and Computational Science, Material Science, and Social Perspective, Economic Governance, and Education. Meron di po, din po tayong 24 poster presentations ngayong araw na ito. So uh, marami tayong, we, we have all to gain in this uh, student faculty conference ng ating College of Arts and Sciences. At this point, I'd also like to introduce to you uh, our three speakers, pero mamaya pa sila uh, mag, magsispeech. We have Dr. Lourdes J. Cruz. Uh, a National Scientist of the National Academy of Science and Technology, also a Professor Emeritus of the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman, and Scientist in Residence of De La Salle University. We also have with us Dr. Christopher Monterola, a Professor at the Asian Institute of Management, where he, he is also the head of the Aboiti School of Information Technology and Entrepreneurship. And, we, and last, we have uh, proprietor engineer Cheris Abrigo, a graduate of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, with a degree in chemical engineering, explained that Cereza, the first zero waste shop to open in Los Baños. No? Siya ang may ari noon. At ang criteria natin for best paper and poster uh, content, 70%, oral presentation, 30% for a total of 100%. So at this point, I would like to invite the UP Rural High School Glee Club for the invocation and the Philippine National Anthem.
That was the UP. To please uh, come on stage to sit on our very beautiful chairs. They'll be joined by our Associate Dean, Dr. Florencia G. Palis, sa harap ng stage. So at this point, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences would like to welcome everyone to the 12th CAS uh, Student Faculty Conference. Uh, Associate Dean Dr. Florencia G. Palis will be uh, reading the message of the Dean. Good morning. On behalf of Dr. Felino Pilansigan, I would like to welcome you all to the 12th Student Faculty Research Conference of CAS. So as mentioned by Sir O'Neill, I will be reading the welcome message of our Dean, Dr. Lansigan, who is currently in the US. To our keynote speaker, National Scientist, Dr. Lourdes Cruz. To our two plenary speakers, Dr. Christopher Monterola of the Asian Institute of Management. Engineer Cheris Abrigo, an engineer entrepreneur, the owner of Cheresa's Cafe. Members of the CAS Exicom to Dr. Joanne May Aguila, Chair of the 12th SFRC, or the, today's conference. Dr. Irene Tanzo, the co-chair of today's conference. Members of the SFRC Organizing Committee, fellow faculty, staff, students, sponsors, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is such a great feeling to be able to talk about a theme that should be a part of intellectual discourse in this time of significant changes across institutions, industries, and even individuals. According to an article written by Bernard Marr, published in Forbes.com, the fourth industrial revolution is not like the past revolutions because it will challenge our ideas about what it means to be human. This revolution entails rapid and massive changes to how we work, communicate, and basically how we live. Apart from convenience, the 4IR, or Fourth Industrial Revolution, also promises increase in income levels, seamless connectivity, an improvement in the overall quality of life. This is an era where technologies and machines can perform autonomously in workplaces and even in our homes. However, this creates a concern among workers across disciplines, as these advances imply their eventual potential replacement in their respective fields, considering that jobs continue to change and emerge. Simply put, some jobs can become obsolete. Professor Klaus Schwab, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum and author of the book entitled The Fourth Industrial Revolution, warned about the potential risk in spite of the great advantages that this revolution offers. He also expressed concern that decision makers or those that hold key positions are too caught up in conventional strategies and with a need to solve pressing problems in the moment that they tend to look pass through these threats. They forget to look ahead and pay attention to disruptive developments so that they can be appropriately dealt with. 
When the Asian Institute of Management conducted a study about workers at risk in the Philippines, it was found out that 97% of the workers from the agriculture sector can be displaced because of automation technologies. Nonetheless, it is not yet viable considering economic factors. That is why there is still a lot of agricultural workers in the country. This suggests that technologies in the 4IR do not pose job-by-job -job disruptions against the industrial landscape, but instead on a task-by-task -task basis. The AIM study focused on agriculture, but what about the challenges and opportunities posed by the fourth industrial revolution to the arts and sciences? First and foremost, we must hone leaders that have the capability to lead us amidst these developments. One who is able and willing to encourage us to adapt to changes by improving our own knowledge, skills, and competencies. In our fields, our need to use technologies in our day-to-day -day task does not defeat our capabilities to fulfill our goals and produce significant accomplishments. In other words, technologies serve as aid, but our asset lie in ourselves. The human resources as arts and science experts. These are our assets. We need to remember that the tools and machineries are primarily made by us and for us. We must work together to proactively deal with disruptions and think of ways on how we can turn challenges to favorable circumstances and opportunities. I would like to end by saying that yes, we must be wary of threats that the future holds, but let us allow ourselves to be excited and look forward to the opportunities that are in store for us. We, after all, create our realities and our future. I wish to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the people who worked tirelessly to make this event a success. Please know that your time and effort are well appreciated. To our researchers, young and old, I encourage you to continue and further your research endeavors so that we can reach not only UPLB, but also the bigger communities and eventually our nation and the world. I hope we all have a productive day ahead. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Associate Dean, Dr. Florencia G. Palace. At this point, I would like to introduce to you our keynote, planner, keynote speaker for the 12th Student Faculty Research Conference. Dr. Lourdes J. Cruz is a national scientist of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Professor Emeritus of the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman, and scientist in residence of De La Salle University. She's the project leader of the DOST-funded Future Earth Philippines program, now being implemented by the National Research Council of the Philippines in collaboration with NAST. Dr. Cruz has served in several capacities in national and international institutions and organizations. One of the two pioneers in the biochemical characterization of neuropeptides of Philippine conus marine snail venoms, she has won several local awards and four international awards, including the 2010 L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science and the FASA's 2001 Asian Outstanding Scientist and Technologist Award. She was also the PSBMB delegate to the IUBMB from 1980 to 1986 and 1992 to 1998. She is a founding member of the Philippine Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and served as its council delegate it to the FAOBMB. She was the president of the National Research Council of the Philippines from 2012 to 2014. 
Professor Cruz served as a member of the Regional Committee for Asia and the Pacific of the International Council for Science from 2012 to 2018 and as chair of the ICSURCAP from 2015 to 2018. She, together with, the professor, with Professor Nordin Hassan of Malaysia and Professor Toshio Yamagata of Japan, conceptualized and worked for the establishment of the Sustainability Initiative for the Marginal Seas of, of South and East Asia, or SIMSEA. In 2001, she established the Rural Link Program to harness science and technology to help alleviate poverty in poor rural communities and indigenous tribes in Bataan through livelihood capacities, activities in conjunction with biodiversity conservation and reforestation activities. It is an honor to introduce to you and to have, us, to have with us national scientist, Dr. Lourdes J. Cruz. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Um, I, and, you know, papasalamat ako dahil naimbita ako ngayon para magsalita dito. Um, dahil, you know, we are trying to disseminate information about our advocacy now, it's a, a project at the same time, an advocacy for sustainability and resilience. And the name of our project is Future Earth Philippines Program for Sustainability and Resilience. Okay, so sustainable development was defined by the uh, Brundtland uh, in the Brundtland Report of the UN in 1987 as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, we say that development is not sustainable uh, when we spend or use all of our resources now and leave nothing for the future generations. So there's deforestation, destruction of marine habitats, destruction of mangroves. So this leads to a biocapacity loss. And we say also that development is not sustainable when we generate waste that nature has difficulty recycling. So as you know, the Philippines is notorious for being the world's third uh, worst plastic polluter, next only to big countries like Indonesia and China. And uh, the Philippines, according to WHO, has the third highest death rate due to outdoor pollution and second uh, uh, highest death rate due to indoor pollution in the Asia-Pacific region. So, Nakakalungkot. And of course, we have, uh, you know, we are uh, heavy consumers and we um, generate waste from households uh, in terms of synthetic clothing, furniture, toys, and gadgets. And there's also pollution for farming and mining activities. And on top of this, we have this uh, regular exposure to destructive natural hazards. The uh, Global Footprint Network uh, looks at the uh, biocapacity and ecological footprint, the trends in the changes in, in this uh, ecological footprint and biocapacity of different countries. And uh, according to uh, this is a graph taken from the website of the Ecological Footprint Network that for, oops, nawala, nagkamali. Can this be bigger? Sorry. Okay. Um, so here is shown, you know, the green line 
shows the biocapacity of the Philippines. And uh, so from about 1961 down to 2014, the data they have now with the web is up to 2016, but I didn't have time to uh, download that. But as you see, there's the trend is, sim this trend is similar, it's decreasing. Our biocapacity is now down to 0.6 uh, global hectares per capita. And if you look at the red line, that's the ecological footprint which says you know, that it's been increasing since 1961, so it's now 1.1 global hectares per capita. And so we have a deficit of point, uh, point 0.5. So the Philippines has been running on, the, on an ecological deficit for more than a half a century. Okay. So uh, concerned about this, we uh, decided, together with a group of scientists um, and representatives from the government, NGOs, and civil society, we decided to form a Future Earth Philippines program for, for sustainability and resilience. Our vision is a progressive and resilient Philippines um, sustained by inclusive science and technology innovation and a culture of integrity, equity, and Filipino values. Our medium-term goals are to improve the national capacity to attain the SDGs through knowledge to action uh, programs. As you know, marami tayong uh, studies about that relates to sustainability but a lot of these remain in the libraries, remain as publications, hindi natin nagagamit, no? So we have to, to uh, try to develop knowledge to action programs so that we can help in the attainment of the SDGs. And we also want to provide science-based policy recommendations for sustainability and resilience. So what is Future Earth? Future Earth is a global initiative for sustainability. Um, it was nurtured by the International Council of Science, which merged with the International Social Science Council in 2018 to form what is now the International Science Council. So, because they realized that to face the challenges that we now have, uh, we need the collaboration among the natural scientists and the social scientists. Hindi pwedeng isa lang. Kailangan, you know, and the approach has been transdisciplinary and inclusive. So only by doing this can we really try to solve the problems that we face now. So on uh, November, November, in November last year, uh, we launched the Future Earth Philippines program. Uh, at the launching of this, we have a representative from Future Earth uh, Global, and, uh, Fumiko, then Future Earth Asia. And uh, this was attended by 200 participants from 10 different countries. And as you see here, in this uh, big picture, we have Secretary De La Peña uh, officiating the launching of Future Earth. So this is my favorite representation of the Sustainable Development Goals, the circular, circular representation, because it shows that the Sustainable Development Goals are really interconnected, hindi sila isa-isa. When you try to solve, to attain one goal, kakabit yung iba, you know. And there can be positive and negative interactions. Okay, and among the things that uh, when our proposal was being reviewed, NEDA insisted that we try to cover all the SDGs and also ambition natin 2040. This is uh, the collective long-term vision and aspirations of the Filipino people for themselves and for the country in the next 25 years based on a survey 
that Neda, Neda did under Secretary Balisakan. Okay, so the vision says that we want a matatag, maginhawa, and panatag na buhay. Okay, well, matatag, the family being together, time with friends, work-life uh, balance, volunteering, maginhawa, we have free from freedom from hunger and poverty, secure home ownership, good transport facilities, travel and vacation, and panatag, enough resources for day-to-day -day needs, unex and uh, unexpected expenses and savings, peace and security, long and healthy life, and comfortable retirement. But what I don't see here is, uh, you know, a mention about the environment, okay? And so the pillars of actually of, of sustainable development has three components and environment is one of the important pillars. So we also have the social and the economic aspects, social that is nurturing and a community and equitable social environment. So dapat hindi tayo yung Crab mentality, dapat magtulung tulunga. And if somebody succeeds, we have to be happy for that success. Okay. And econom the economic aspect is also very important. So, sufficient and sustainable economic development and the environment, both natural and built environment. Okay. We have a website. This is Future Earth Philippines, futureearthph.org. And so we show here that, the Philippi that sustainability is our main concern. And uh, in uh, October last year, we held a um, workshop on uh, assessment of Philippine sustainability and uh, what the uh, and we, what we want to do, okay? So we discuss topics like um, open data, the need for open data, you know, so that we can act fast, land system change, health ecosystem, blue carbon, uh, urban sustainability, among others. So as I said, approach is transdisciplinary and inclusive while aiming for agility. In the implementation of the project, we found it so difficult to be, uh, you know, to be agile because of the COA requirements. Ang hirap gumalaw, hindi mo ma-implement agad yung project. Everything was delayed, and you know, even your uh, application for refund of expenses and trying to plan for something is so difficult and daming papeles na kailangan and dapat mabawasan sana yan and so we're going to talk to in fact this afternoon we're going to talk to COA about this problem and so this is another page from the website and again showing that uh, inclusive science for resilience is and sustainability is one of our focus Okay, so inclusive science, and so this is one uh, of our workshops where that was held for indigenous communities because we think that indigenous communities are very important because they are the natural stewards of our resources. So the, uh, our participants came from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And uh, most of them are involved in the ICCA project of DENR and UNDP. ICCA means Indigenous Communities Conservation, uh, I forgot the A, <laughs> Conserv yeah, Conservation uh, uh, Initiative. Okay. So we talked about how uh, when we started the project, 
we, decide, we thought that maybe the easiest thing to do is assign people into clusters so that they can think about the problem in their own clusters. And um, so we have here on the left side uh, a cluster on fresh water, a cluster on energy and urban ecosystems, a cluster on marine and coastal ecosystems, public health, disaster risk uh, reduction, uh, environment and biodiversity, plastic waste, and land system change. And on uh, discussing how we can put all of this together, we thought maybe the focus, uh, I, I guess, we met, we meaning uh, Doy Romero, Rod Asansa, Bertrand Yola, and myself, when we decided that, that perhaps the best way we can put all these clusters together is by having as a main SDG, sustainable communities and cities. And with sustainable cities and communities, we need healthy people and healthy environment. Okay, so the upper part uh, above the dotted blue line uh, are what we want to attain uh, in terms of the SDGs. We want, if the, we have sustainable cities and communities, we can have, we should have uh, decent work and economic growth, and that should lead to no poverty, no hunger, and good health and well-being. On the other hand, for a healthy, healthy environment, you need to conserve the life on land, life below water, and we need clean water and sanitation. And below this are the SDGs that we think are interventions. So that among the interventions, education, quality education is the most important. Okay? Because if you have quality education, you can devise ways on how to have a indus the industry innovation and infrastructure that we need, how to have affordable and clean energy, what to do for, uh, you know, to, um, to prepare for the climate hazards, and sustainable consumption and production is also very important uh, on how we can control the availability of our uh, resources. And below this are four SDGs that we consider as the guiding principles. Gender equality, reduced inequalities, peace and justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goals. So these are the uh, guiding principles that we should consider when we look at the, all the different SDGs. Okay. Among the things, you know, as we, go, as we went around to different places, Mindanao, Visayas, Luzon, we found that the, one of the easiest things uh, for people to understand is sustainable consumption and production. Kasi lahat tayo, we are all consumers. And <coughs> sustainable consumption is defined uh, as the use of goods and services which respond to basic needs and bring a better quality of life while minimizing the use of natural resources and toxic materials as well as the emissions of waste and pollutants over the life cycle of the goods and services. Okay. And so I think look at these facts that we have now. You have 1.3 billion uh, tons of food Tons of food is wasted per year while almost 2 billion people go hungry or undernourished. Only 3% of the world's water is drinkable and we are using it at faster than nature can replenish it. There are 2 billion people who are overweight or obese globally and I say we're gu I'm guilty of this. Uh, 
Then the food sector, the food sector accounts for around 22% of total greenhouse gas emissions, largely from the conversion of forest into farmland. 20% of world's final energy consumption in 2013 was from, on, was from renewable sources. So there's still the 80% that comes from non-renewable resources. So $120 billion is, will be saved annually if people everywhere switch to energy efficient light bulbs and uh, also um, the appliances. Okay, so I'd like to quote, to quote here Gandhi who says, there's really enough in the world for everyone's need, but there is not enough for everyone's greed. So we have to uh, try to curb our overconsumption through the use of prudent use of resources, renewable resources, green systems, uh, efficient uh, appliances and cars, and uh, minimizing waste so that we can go to, towards sustainable consumption. Okay, here's an example of uh, a problem tree analysis for plastic waste. And as you know, we, here it is. So our main problem is huge amounts of plastic waste in the environment. And in the, of course, the source of this plastic waste are the high, uh, the, the ultimate source is the high plastics production and the unnecessary and single use of plastics. And then this is coupled with the, uh, our, uh, you know, our um, indiscriminate disposal of our plastic waste. So this has led to economic losses, loss of livelihood, loss of biodiversity, and bad effects on human health. And uh, we think that for us to solve the plastics problem, we need the uh, collaboration among government, academe, civil society, and industry. And these are among the things that can be done by the different sectors. For academe researchers that can have uh, on the degradation of fungi and mi uh, uh, by fungi and microbes, biodegradable plastics and products, life cycle analysis. And then for the civil society, we need uh, a strategic communication for behavioral change, citizen science, and reduction and reuse of plastics. And the industry can also help. Uh, we, and they are now aware of this, and we see many, uh, a number of uh, industries that are really trying to do something to help in the, with the plastic waste. And the government, we have had the, uh, you know, the management uh, a law on the management of plastic waste, but not all LGUs have, uh, have responded to this. Okay, thank you. So society, according to Helen Jordan, society needs to stop thinking of plastic as waste, but as a renewable resource that needs to be disposed of correctly. So we want to transition from a, from a linear take, make, and dispose to a circular economy. And uh, again, the Accenture uh, in 2015 uh, published a book on waste to wealth that creating advantage in a circular economy and that if we are able to uh, recycle things, there's a 4.5 trillion reward for achieving circular economy as a business model. And so this is, uh, you know, the different uh, revolutions, industrial revolutions that we have. The fourth revolution is characterized by, you know, computers, wireless connectivity, digital platforms, artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, even blockchain, smart materials, and even the ability to edit the genome. And, uh, but, you know, in spite of the fourth industrial revolution coming in already, 
we still have about 600 million people on smaller holder farms without access to any mechanization. So their lives are still untouched by the first industrial revolution. And there's still one third of the world's population uh, without clean drinking water and safe sanitation, one half billion, no electricity. So they have not even reached the second industrial revolution. And there's the thir three billion people without access to internet. And uh, so, and they have not accessed the third industrial revolution. So as we go to the fourth uh, industrial revolution, maybe the level of inequality will increase. And so we have to prepare for this so that the Philippines will not be left out. And so with the population growth, this will become more a uh, very serious problem. And according to Klaus Schwab, who published the book on fourth industrial revolution, the industrial revolution is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological. And in fact, on our identity, include, you know, on our sense of privacy and our development. So uh, he says, he, to, uh, he enjoins us, uh, let us together shape a future that works for all by putting people first, empowering them, and constantly reminding ourselves that all of these new technologies are first and foremost tools made by people for people. And according to Hans Wetzberg, uh, one can take advantage of the uh, technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, and that he says that emerging technologies can buy us time in the race against catastrophic climate change and other problems that we face now if we only you know, put together our heads uh, towards this. So with that, you know, uh, my advocacy is for us to collaborate, government, academic, industry, and business, and civil, civil society together. Let's work together for sustainable consumption production and for sustainability and resilience of the Philippines, Asia, and the world. Thank you. Once again, let's give our national scientist, Dr. Luli Cruz, the warmest war round of applause that we can give. Marami pong salamat, ma'am, and we are truly inspired to work together to achieve resilience and sustainability in our country and in the region. Okay, so the secretary just told me that we have time for one or two questions from the audience. So do we have um, questions? Yes, sir. Good morning, Bob. Uh, my question is, do you have any particular requests or questions from, you think, which can be answered by uh, requests from uh, what you need from us, from the CES, UPLU, what you think uh, is there a potential that we think uh, specifically that we can contribute to this effort? Mm -hmm. uh, um, right now, the Future Earth team has members uh, three clusters actually from Los Baños and they have put together uh, proposals for uh, the land uh, related to land system change related to climate change and biodiversity and the environment and I suggest that the this uh, they are based uh, well the leaders are De Eslava of Sesam, uh, Vicky Espaldon, and Rex Cruz. So they've been meeting here for some time, but 
I will tell them you, you to, put, to have you in the loop, to have everybody here in the loop, because I know many are interested to contribute. And you know, what we are trying to do now is instead of resubmit, so that's for phase one, the making of, uh, of proposals, knowledge to action proposals. Uh, instead of maintaining it as a future Earth Philippines program, what we are going to do now is uh, propose to the ASD that Future Earth Philippines be a platform where people, through which people can submit programs related to sustainability. Para hindi hawak ng isang tao, ba? each program will be independent, pero kailangan may coordination, you know, para hindi tayo watak-watak. So, yung, uh, the program should be reinforcing each other and each the projects, of course, in a program will be there to reinforce the programs and the programs will be there to reinforce our uh, goal to attain sustainability and resilience. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruz. Thank you very much for the questions. Do we have any more questions? So in the absence of any more questions, let's proceed to uh, the awarding of certificates and tokens. May we invite Associate Dean Dr. Florencia Palace and Dr. Mejo Ann Agala, the chair of the 12th uh, SFRC of CAS, to award our certificate of appreciation and our token. The certificate reads, College of Arts and Sciences, UPLB, presents the certificate of appreciation to National Scientist Lourdes J. Cruz, for her generous time and effort as a plenary speaker during the 12th UPLB CAS Student Faculty Conference with the theme, Fourth Industrial Revolution, Challenges and Opportunities for the Arts and Sciences, given this 18th of November, 2019, at the College of Arts and Sciences Auditorium, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, signed Major and B. Aguila, Chair of the 12th UPLB CAS SFRC, and Felino P. Lansigan, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much, ma'am. Palapakan po natin si National Scientist Lourdes Cruz. We now move on to our second plenary talk. Dr. Christopher Monterola is a professor at the Asian Institute of Management, where he is also the head of the Aboiti School of Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. A-Site is the newest of the four schools of AIM that houses three academic programs. Under A-Site, it's also an advanced analytics research lab that is industry facing the analytics computing complex systems lab where he is both the executive managing director and a senior specialist prior to joining aim dr monterola was a senior scientist at the institute of high performance computing in the agency for science technology and research a Sing Singapore's lead government agency for fostering world-class scientific research. He was the capability group manager of the complex systems capability group of the IHPC. Dr. Monterola was also the principal investigator and scientific director of the complexity science program of the IHPC under the CXCY. Aside from teaching in UPD, he also mentored and advised physics students on their research dissertations. In 2008 and 2011, respectively, Dr. Monterola received the Achievement Award from the National Research Council of the Philippines and the Outstanding Young Scientist Award from the DOSD National Academy of Science and Technology because of his significant contributions to science and techno in the country. Also in 2011, he was a Young Scientist Awardee of NAST. In 2009, 
the SEA EU Net organized a mapping study of excellent researches, researchers from the Asian member countries with obtaining of raising awareness for the existence of high quality research and presenting a pool of excellent researchers in Southeast Asia. Dr. Monterola was featured as an excellent researcher in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk about future proofing of the Philippine workforce in the era of Industry 4.0, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Christopher Monterola. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Gising pa po kayo? Okay, so uh, my, the, I, the, the title of my talk is Four Challenges. I will be giving four ideas, four perspectives about the challenges of Industry 4.0, especially uh, with respect to the Philippines workforce, lalo na po sa mga estudyante, professors ng CAS. <clears throat> uh, first, a uh, brief background. I am from the Asian Institute of Management. I am a physicist by training, pero ngayon po ako ay nasa isang business school. AIM uh, is the choice of the C-level executives in the country. So karamihan po ng mga C-level executives natin, karamihan uh, nag-aaral sila dito. Dati po siyang consortium of three schools, UP, Ateneo, Lasal, Harvard, at ng mga iba't ibang uh, conglomerates, uh, Lopez Group, Ayala Group. Uh, CSIP group, pero umalis ang UP because uh, dahil public ang UP. So baka magkakaroon ng conflict of interest if you will be running a business school. First challenge of Industry 4.0, we are looking at a new landscape, a new business landscape, a changing world. And the reason for this will be because of the following technological trends. One, there is the so-called proliferation of smart devices. We talk of smartphones, we talk of smart cities, smart gadgets, smart devices. And because of these devices, we are producing a lot of data. Ito po ang lahat ng data that you are producing in one second. Isang segundo, more than 2.6 emails ang napapadala ninyo. No? In one second, about 63,000 Google searches. One second, read in, read out, isang segundo. Now, uh, the, 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 the total amount of data that we are producing is actually every two to three years, 90% of the total amount of data that we have produced since the start of human civilization. Or roughly translated, if we look at it at another term, this implies that every two to three years, we are producing nine to ten times more data compared to all data that exists currently. Meaning, in ten years' time, you will be looking at a data that is 1,000 times compared to all the data that we have right now. 1,000 times. Okay? Now, the good news is that this data can now be installed. No? Can now be stored. Ang mga bata dito, hindi, hindi na ninyo alam ang mga devices na to. No? Nagulat ako na uh, maraming, uh, marami po sa mga millennials, hindi na nila alam kung bakit ganito ang itsura ng save button, no? nag exist po yan noong 1980s. Ginamit po yan ang mga teacher ninyo, no? And it can store 1.4 MB of data. Not even sufficient, not even sufficient to store one high-resolution photo of your smartphone now, which is about 5 to 6 MB. The total amount of data that can be stored in this uh, devices now can go up to 1 million times compared to three decades ago. We can store this data. We produce a lot of data. We can store this data. And at the same time, we can crunch this data. This is the first supercomputer known as ENIAC. Literally, the size of this supercomputer is the same size as this hall. It can fit a bus. And it's quite fast. It can do 5,000 instructions per second. Very fast. If I ask you 20 times 4, probably it will take you 3 seconds to solve that. 2 seconds, maybe. No? Mga tagamat dito, kaya siguro ng 1.2 seconds. But this computer can do that, 5,000 of that problems in less than a second. But an iPhone, an old version of iPhone, an iPhone 7, can do this 25 billion times. 25 billion times. This is in the span of three decades. 
So this is essentially the essence of the so-called Industry 4.0. We are producing a lot of data. This data can be stored. This data can be crunched. And as a result, there is a lot of changing things that is happening. No? Business are changing. Innovation is not just changing, but accelerating. And in relation, nakita ko kasi dito sa CAS, nandito rin ang mga com arts, etc. Ang mga social sciences natin. And which is, I will say later, isa sa pinakamagandang combination ng college kapag hinarness nyo properly itong ganitong collaboration. Ito po yung mga nalaman natin dahil sa data. We now know the following human tendencies. We know how people are connected. This is Facebook. You can see that there is no China and Russia there because hindi allowed ang Facebook sa kanilang country. We know how people interact people. I'm focusing on people. We know how people are interact with existing institutions. This is uh, people in Spain, Barcelona, withdrawing from ATMs. So makikita po ninyo kung nasaan ang wealth at any given time. We know how people are moving. This is a, a UK airport. Makikita natin ilan ang dumadating, kailan dumadating, etc. And all this information, because of all this information, okay, this is another one, uh, a simulation of all the movement of trucks, trains, etc. We're uh, working with uh, doing this in the Philippines. We know how people are moving. We also have a better in understanding now of how diseases, gossips, and even informations are propagating. This is from a collaborator. They can predict exactly what is the impact of H1N1 uh, because of the mobility of human population. Okay? So again, to summarize, okay, Industry 4.0, this industrial revolution was really brought about by the fact that we are producing a lot of data. This data can be stored and this data can be crunched, resulting to new paradigms being developed, new business models being developed. But for most of you here, lalo na sa mga gagraduate at gumag mga sudyante ng CAS, ito po ang reality. Ang mga companies that can before has a lifespan of 75 years, meaning they can exist for 75 years, this is a data from S&P, a multi-billion company in the U.S., now, in 2012, this lifespan of 78 years is down to 15, and now it is down to 12. What is the significance of this? The significance of this is that in this generation, okay, over one lifetime, over your lifetime, where you will be working for about 40 to 45 years, you are forced to go into three to four different companies. Not because you would want to, but because that will happen. Okay, if you want to be, if you will be part of a global workforce. So that is the first thing. New landscape is changing. Challenge two: data-driven operations are the new normal. In this example, I will be demonstrating po sa inyo by illustration by looking at the different things that we have done. How data is changing the way we do things. Not just in the industry, but also in the operations of the uh, lead government uh, institutions. And, uh, of course, the workforce will be impacted by this. As mentioned, prior to joining AIM, I, 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 uh, I work in Singapore, in the think tank of Singapore, the uh, A-STAR. Our goal there is to really help the industries and government agencies to innovate through science and technology. Sa Singapore po kasi, Pag hindi nakapag-deliver ang politiko sa pinangako niya, kailangan niyang mag-resign. So ang kailangan niyang gawin, kailangan niyang kumonsulta sa mga scientists para kung nagkaroon siya ng mali, kaya sabihin niya na ituro that given the most best available information that I have, ito yung ginawa namin. At ituturo ko ang mga scientists na to na nagpayo sa amin. Otherwise, kapag nagawa siya ng decision that he cannot, uh, uh, no, kailangan niyang mag-resign. No? This is not necessary true here in the Philippines. One of the work that we have done is design the entire transport system in Singapore. So the, the transport system of Singapore is actually a, a result of a data-driven uh, operation. Uh, ito po yung isang uh, system na kung mapunta kayo sa Urban Redevelopment Authority ng Singapore, makikita ninyo itong, itong system na to. And this was designed actually by uh, Filipinos, okay? led by Filipinos. Makikita nyo po dito sa system na to. At any point in Singapore, how long it will take you to travel uh, any place in Singapore? 
That is a simple visualization, but it's very useful because then you will know which areas in Singapore cannot be accessed properly. And therefore, the government has to invest okay, in putting shuttle buses maybe in those areas or those locations. At the heart of this simulation tool is a simulation of the entire public transport system of Singapore, data-driven solution. No? Makikita ninyo ang galaw lahat ng train, buses, kung gaano karami ang nasa station at any point in time, saan pumupunta ang tao. Uh, you will see here uh, people going and getting out of the uh, station. This is Jurong East. Uh, makikita ninyo yung, uh, the size of the circle will tell you how many people are in the station. And if you click that, you will see here uh, the waiting time before you will be able to board the train. And you can see how full the trains are at any point in time. With this type of platform, with this data-driven platform, you can do scenario modeling. Okay, for example, I can disrupt a specific platform, and the disruption of that specific platform, like for example, Clementi, will tell you how this disruption will propagate throughout the entire public transport system. And the disruption is complex in a manner that even a, uh, a station 10 kilometers away from where the disruption happened can be impacted. Now, there are a lot of policy that was produced as a result of this, including, gaano ba tayo kabilis dapat magre-respond? Saan ba natin ilalagay ang mga sasakyan kapag nagkaroon ng disruption? Papaano ba ang magiging impact kapag binigyan ko na free ang lahat ng mga umaalis ng maaga sa bahay? No? All of this can be driven by policy and nothing, there is no way a human gut feel will be able to beat this type of system. Here is another example from Philippine setting. We have worked with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. This is uh, a typical load for them. They are looking at the financial institutions. It will take them 40 man hours to evaluate one financial institution and they do this quarterly. And there are 500 financial institutions in the average that they are evaluating. So all in all, it will take them 20,000 man hours to evaluate 500 accounts every quarter. And they do this manually. With the help of AI and network science, we combine artificial intelligence and network science, we were able to reduce this to 11 minutes. 20,000 man hours to 11 minutes. No? Pero ano po ang impact nito? Yung mga dating nagtatrabaho na nagagamit natin para magtrabaho ng 20 man hours, mas hindi na dapat. Dapat silang mag-upskill. Kasi kayang gawin itong trabaho na to ng 11 minutes ng machine at hindi napapagod ang machine. Kaya niya pa yan i-double check or i-triple check if necessary. So this is a reduction of more than 99.9% .9 of time. Another example, prediction of water level. Ah... Uh, this is a real problem. Katulad po ng sinabi ni Ma'am Lourdes Cruz. In Metro Manila, mas maswerte kayo dito sa Los Baños, next year, summer, conservatively, there will be 150 million liters per day, per day, nakukulangin na tubig. Kasing dami po ng hindi maliligo at walang tubig sa isang araw na 700,000 na individual sa Metro Manila. Parang buong Makati yan or buong Taguig. No? Ang problema, wala talagang water source na papagkukuhanan sila. No? But this is a step, okay? Ginawa po namin ito matagal na, pero ngayon, we will be putting sensors all throughout the different stations in Metro Manila para, sa, para i-improve yung uh, water loss, i-reduce ang water loss. But this is predicting ang gut water level dam, uh, ang gut dam water level. Magic number of ang gut dam is 180 meters. If it's lower than 180 meters, there can be water shortage. If it is higher than 180 meters and there's too much rain, it can cause flash floods. So, uh, we created a deep learning algorithm to forecast this. Makikita nyo po yung dust lines as yung prediction namin two years after we have deployed the technology. At makikita ninyo yung actual na water level na kaparehong kapareho halos ng prediction natin. Before we did this, Six to seven individuals po ang gumagawa ng forecast na to. And they can be nowhere close to the way we are predicting it. We can do the prediction six to seven months in advance. Ngayon, ayaw na nilang pakilaman yung ginipinipredict dahil baka lalong masira. No? 
That is another challenge. Pa paano kung karamihan ng mga nasa Manila Water ay graduate ng UP, engineering? No? Kapag hindi nag-upskill at intindihan itong mga bagong technology na to, magkakaroon ng challenge uh, sa mga uh, sa workforce na nagagalawan ninyo. But uh, they, they, those are uh, wonderful technology. But again, may consequences siya. No? Ito po ay trabaho that we've done with uh, In One Go. Okay? Uh, a small company, not actually a startup, but a small or a medium enterprise. Uh, we help them understand how to uh, link yung mga dinidisplay sa store at yung mga binibili ng tao at kung ano yung pwede nilang i-order beforehand. No? Uh, with various machine learning models, different feature engineering models, we were able to help them uh, create a way to predict eight weeks in advance ano yung mga dapat ninyong i-display at ano yung mga dapat i-order ng iba't ibang store ninyo. As a result of such, they were able to one, uh, win a, a, a big award about 1.5 to 2 billion dollars that translates to jobs. No? Natutuwa po kami dito kasi ang kalaban nila dito is Capgemini. These are big DHL, uh, DHL. These are big companies that uh, since they get this, they will be able to add jobs to the Philippine, the Filipino people. Patuka sa manok, apparently, isa sa pinakamalaking industry sa Pilipinas yun, no? para sa mga pansabong that our OFWs would rather buy vitamins para sa mga pansabong nila bago vitamins para sa mga anak nila. I was surprised sa ganitong idea. But uh, ang malaking problema ng mga nagpo-produce ng feeds na to is spoilage. Pag hindi nila nabenta dahil sa spoilage. So we help them uh, properly understand this. Isa po sa mga dinevelop ng, namin sa, sa Institute ng AIM ay magkaroon ng maraming maraming geeks sa Institute na yon. In fact, Maraming marami po ngayon kaming hinahanap na scientists at physicists na pinapabalik from different parts of the world to join us. And if we will be able to have a business mindset and use the technical know-how of our scientists, our engineers, malaki ang mapuproduce na change nito sa ating, uh, sa, sa ating industry at sa ating GDP in general, sa ating economy. For example, ito po ang mga iba't ibang ginagawa namin. Capstone projects are defined by the industry. But we have to make sure, the, the professors have to make sure that there is novelty okay, in those projects that they will be doing. So business value is there. We make sure that there is novelty when they pursue such. And ito po yung result ng unang set ng capstone. Nagbabayad po ang mga industry event para ma-solve yung mga problems nila. And last year, we were able to, and this is very conservative, to increase by 10 million dollars or about 500 million pesos yung revenue ng mga partner institutions namin. Now this amount is conservative and this amount is not given by our students. This amount is given by the CFOs of the different companies. My point here is in the academic setting, pag tinama po natin ang uh, ability natin na maintindihan ng business value, nandi dito ang pinakamalaking set ng mga brain power para isolve yung mga problems na meron sila. And of course, we can still produce top-tier uh, journal publications as a result of this. This is something that is uh, close to me, kaya gusto ko pong pag-usapan. Vulnerables will be more vulnerable. Ito po ang industry 4.0. May mga bagong trabaho, pero ang mga vulnerables, they will be more vulnerables. Uh, the effect of AI across industries is projected to be 65% by 2022, and they have increased it to 80% last year by 2022, both in the products and offerings. And if you look at the skill demands, yung mga bagay po na madami tayong nilalagay ngayon, attention to detail, trustworthiness, coordination and time management, through technology, hindi na po magiging ganun ka-importante yan in four years' time. Ang magiging importante, kailangan marunong na mag-code. No? Of course, analytical thinking innovation will be top, but systems of systems thinking will be another important uh, 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 skill set. No? Uh, but let me discuss the impact of Industry 4.0 to Filipino workers in terms of gender, region, age, income, and educational attainment. So how did we conduct this study? We did not survey because survey is bias. Pag nag-survey ka sa mga C-level executives, hindi rin naman nila alam ang AI at Industry 4.0, lalo na sa Pilipinas, malamang mali ang makukuha mong data. 
But there is this wonderful article by Pray in Osborne where they look at the impact or the chance that some jobs will be computerized. And they base this on a very wonderful fundamental, uh, wonderful scientific idea. Tinitingnan nila ang lahat ng component ng isang trabaho at bawat component na yon, through the help of the different scientists, they are looking at what is the chance that they can be automated or a future technology can be developed to solve that particular bottleneck. No? It's wonderful. It's a wonderful work. And ito po yung mga kayang i-automate. Hand sewers, telemarketers, title examiners, physicists. I'm a physicist. It's 10% chance. Shampooers, 79% chance. Embalmers, okay, 54% chance. Ang mga mahirap i-automate po, recreational therapists, emergency management director, those where you need to make a decision at a very fast uh, with limited information and uh, you should make the decision quite fast. No? Yun ang mas mahirap i-automate. Now, uh, what we have done in this work is we look at the 2015 Family Income and Expenditure Survey that looks, surveys more than 200,000 jobs in the Philippines. Tiningnan po namin lahat ng mga trabaho na yan at tiningnan namin using artificial intelligence, specifically ang uh, natural language processing, kung ano ang relation ng mga jobs na to sa mga jobs na in-identify ni Erwin and Frey and Osborne. If we will do this manually, the total number of combinations will be 11 billion. No? So mahirap siyang gawin. Almost humanly impossible na tingnan mo siya ng accurately. But you can do natural language processing. The main idea here is that the similarity of text by looking at billions of, uh, billions of documents in the web, makikita mo how this word is related to this word and to what extent. No? With that idea, we come up with uh, this result. I will not discuss for the detail, but this is the result that I will be sharing with you. One, 78% of our workforce has a 50% chance of being automated. This is based on a 200,000 surveyed work nationwide. So generally, this is uh, reliable. 78% has 50% chance of being automated. In terms of gender, ang mga trabaho po ng babae sa Pilipinas, mas mahirap ma-automate. Ibig sabihin, mas safe ang mga babae sa automation kaysa sa mga lalaki. No? Because top jobs for males are agri in agricultural which has an 87% chance of being automated or construction laborers which has an 88% chance of being automated. While for female, Retail sales workers and product promoters are among the top uh, in terms of uh, frequency and the chance of them being automated is less than agriculture, being an agricultural worker. Second, region. In terms of the region, NCR ang mas less prone sa at automation. Region 3, which is an agricultural region, ang pinaka prone sa automation. In terms of AIDS, Ang mga bata, mas madaling i-automate. Habang tumatanda, mas mahirap i-automate. No? In terms of economic indicators, income classes, so I use the work of PIDS, uh, Toots Got My Tan, and how they define the range of income yearly. Poor, if you are earning, your household is earning less than 100,000. And rich and very rich, if you are getting more than 1.4 million. Okay? Result is the same. The more vulnerable sectors, chances are they will be more vulnerable due to Industry 4.0. Chance of being automated kapag very poor ka is about 83%. If you are very rich, kalahati lang nun. No? Educational attainment, the same story. If you, if, you can't find, uh, if you will not be able to finish elementary, your chance of being automated is about 93%. If you finish college and even has a, 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 a master or degree, your chance is about 45-48%. So, in its conclusion, the more vulnerable sector are more vulnerable to, to do this industry 4.0. We need to upskill and reskill. Okay? Now, I'm part of the uh, DTI's initiative to create a national AI roadmap for the Philippines. Ang isang maganda pong news, number three tayo sa ASEAN pagdating sa AI readiness. This is interesting. Number three, after Singapore, uh, Malaysia, pangatlo po tayo. Whereas, pagdating sa livable cities, 
pinakadulo tayo ng ASEAN. No? Number, uh, dulo tayo, and in the, to all the cities that they have surveyed in the world, we are number 94 out of 102 cities. Now, how do you upskill? Okay, I will not discuss the detail of this, but one of the ideas that we come up, uh, isa sa mga research na ginawa namin, ay tiningnan namin po ang lahat ng jobs sa Pilipinas and how they are linked to one another. They are linked if they are sharing the same set of skill set. And with this, we can determine the so-called Jakarta Index. May mga statisticians dito sa class, dito, so naiintindihan nila yan. It's essentially, it's a measurement of how close one job is to another job based on the similarity of skills. So we will be able to create the network of this, but here is the idea. We can look at all the community of jobs. Malalaman po natin kung ano yung mga nasa finance, mga counselors, mga manual laborers, mga custodians, at kapag mas pula ka dyan, ibig sabihin, mas mataas ang chance mo na ma-automate. But, okay, what this work also tells us is what is, how do we then start upskilling and reskilling the Philippine workforce. For example, this is the finance community. If you want to be upskilled from a credit, uh, from... Okay? From credit counselors to credit analysts, which has a higher salary and less chance of being automated, makikita po natin exactly kung ano yung mga skill set na kailangan ninyong ilagay. Which can, of course, help TESDA to decide kung ano yung mga susunod na kailangan nilang itrain. Ngayon, ang tinitrain ng TESDA karamihan ay masus at construction workers. No? And upskilling, same thing. Okay, we can do upskilling as a result of this. Okay, I will not go and discuss this, but uh, I will be happy to share eventually the, 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 this, this article with every one of you. Last component of my talk, a new breed of STEM graduates is needed. Okay, STEM, of course, refers to science, technology, uh, scientists, okay, technologies, uh, engineering, mathematics, yung M, and yung A can be arts and agriculture, no? Uh, what is lacking in most STEM graduates? Let me start by doing that, based on the employer survey 2017. Ito daw ang mga problema ng mga STEM graduates, kaya underpaid sila sa mga developing countries. One, they have no business sense, not much business sense. They don't connect themselves with the business value ng isang company. And therefore, they are being paid per hour instead of their value to the company. Real world analysis and decision making. Pag merong dalawang problem, ang isang ituturo sa inyo ng mentor ninyo, dalawang problem, parehong mahirap, Okay, kailangan yung piliin yung isa na mas marami ang impact. Or kung kailangan yung itwist ng konti yung problem para magkaroon ng mas maraming impact, pero pareho lang ang gagawin yung hirap, you have to do that. No? Third component, compelling communication skills. The ability to communicate concisely to, to the point. No? And teamwork and people skills. Ano po ang natutunan ng Google nung tiningnan nila ang mga high-performing teams? Isang bagay lang ang nakita nila. Nung tinignan nila lahat ng high-performing teams, they spent millions of dollars to understand what is the most and important critical characteristic of a high-performing team? Kindness. Kailangan ang doon ng element ng kindness. And everyone will have an open mind uh, and they, everyone can be productive. Now, cause in this, we are, we are in this so-called buka world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, maybe at this point po, ipasasabihin ko sa inyo yung mga ilan sa mga na ginawa namin and hopefully this can be, be useful also for the students and researchers here at CAS. One, gusto kong sabihin, and this is a good news, most visionaries, they have CAS degrees. Okay? Most visionaries. If you look at the top companies, I I uh, Gandalf, no? Google, Amazon, Netflix, DBS, Apple, LinkedIn, Facebook, Gandalf, magicians. Okay, and you look at those who, who actually pioneered and started these companies, makikita ninyo po na karamihan ay pwedeng maproduce nitong college na to. Computer scientist si Larry Page and Brin. Larry Page invented the so-called page rank algorithm. Yung page rank algorithm na yun ang tumalo, ng, na tinalo ng Google ang Yahoo dahil sa algorithm na yun. He's a computer scientist and a computer engineer. 
Bezos is an electrical engineer, honor grad, top grad ng Princeton. Netflix, Hastings is a mathematician. Okay, DBS, digital transformation, almost all of them is STEAM grads. Apple, Jobs and Wozniak, of course, Arts, itong si Jobs, computer scientist si Wozniak. Hoffman, symbolic system, which is a combination of both philosophy and computer science. Zuckerberg is, of course, a computer scientist. Now, one of the, maybe this is, will be my last statement, embrace entrepreneurial spirit. Okay? Embrace in entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, this is the idea of the school that was created at AIM two years ago. And now this is the biggest school in AIM. Mostly geeks. Okay? Mostly STEM graduate. Ang difference po ng meron kaming MS, Masters of Science in Data Science, meron kaming Master of Science in Innovation and Business, lahat po ito ay mga STEM grads. Pero ang isa sa mga maganda na na-produce namin dito ay pinagsama namin sila with entrepreneurs. 740 household brands in the Philippines are actually graduate of AIM. Pag tinignan po ninyo yung mga yan, lahat yan AIM grads. Potato Corner, Cafe Mary Grace, Sogo, etc. Uh, and in the average, the, the, their businesses has an annual revenue of about 162 million pesos. Naraman namin na para magtaas ang mga values ng mga geeks, kailangan nilang matuto ng entrepreneurial spirit. At isa sa mga una pong ginawa ko nung naging head ako nito, nagsimula itong uh, school na to, nung bumalik ako mula sa Singapore, maglagay ng beer para maiklose ang kanilang utak at puso minsan ang gumana. And guess what is the alcohol content of this beer? Geek din, no? Ang alcohol content po nito ay 6.28%. Higher than usual. And why 6.28%? It is twice time, twice pi, no? Two pi. Two pi alcohol content. We brewed this own beer sa loob ng AIM. So, uh, mahal ang tuition ng AIM pag kinumpare sa mga Philippine institutions, but if you look at the international institutions, it is actually cheaper. But uh, one of my advocacy is eventually, hopefully, we can make this free for everyone na gustong mag-aral doon. No? So right now, 33% of our students are, uh, have full sponsorships from these companies, different companies. Pag na-accept kayo, saka pa lang nila kayo i-sponsor. And the return to the companies, hindi ito uh, kawanggawa nila. Malaki ang return nito sa kanila because they will be getting students who can easily make their company fly. We get a $10 million Aboites donation because we combine the geeks and the entrepreneurs. Okay? And this is essentially a good portion of this will be used for scholarships of the student and research, of course. That is why we are named Aboites School of Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. <coughs> and uh, after, upon graduation, uh, uh, our students will be able to increase after 15 months their salary by 2.5 times. Again, embracing the idea of technology and AI, 2.5 times. So ito po yung mga iba't ibang position na nakuha nila after uh, completing their degree. Vice President for Digital Solutions and Platforms ng isa sa pinakamalaking bank sa Pilipinas. And we do research that not just impact, uh, we, it impacts the industry. You can see this is one of the projects that we have completed at makikita po ninyo dito siguro ang isang dosena sa top 500 na taxpayer sa Pilipinas. No? You can see there JASA, you will see there uh, Arthur Tan, uh, you will see there Rene Almendras, etc. Uh, the top honchos of the Ayala Corporation. And uh, it is safe to say that business schools now is changing because we are now, business schools are embracing STEM grads, STEM graduates. At maganda po ang CAS kasi unlike sa UP Diliman na counterpart ninyo, magkahiwalay ang College of Science at saka College of Arts dahil dapat magkasama ang dalawang ito. No? And I suggest na mag, magkaroon kayo ng mas maraming open house, beer party para mag-usap-usap yung mga tao nyo dito. Okay, with that, I uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Monterola. Do we have time for we have time for one question from the audience? Yes, sir. Sir, um, maraming po salamat sa inyong uh, 
lecture. My, my, my name is Palguera from BSS CAS. Okay, sir, given this situation of artificial intelligence, big data, and, and maybe the cell phone is more effective. May, may, maybe, ah, baka, baka naman, sana yung teacher ng mga estudyante ngayon, mga, cell, mga smartphone. Pero, ang tanong ko lang is that, So, which means, at least in the data science field, if you, want, if you will be hiring a data scientist, halimbawa, ang tinitingnan mo is yung portfolio niya. Ano yung mga nagawa niya, no? Ang isa sa pinaka-critical na, na subject that I, I hope it will be, hopefully, will be incorporated in the curriculums of UP. Uh, I've, I've taught in UP for 15 years. No? Ang critical po siguro na ilagay would be one, ang concept ng design thinking. Ang idea po ng design thinking compared to the usual scientific method na nagpa-formulate tayo ng hypothesis, we do measurement and experiment, etc., Ang constant na ilalagay mo doon will be empathy. Understanding uh, if you will be able to solve their, this problem, who will be using that solution? Em empathy will be one uh, critical component. Second po, maraming natutulong kapag marunong mag-code ang isang individual. Pag tinignan po natin ang